on the line, but uh, welcome to the call. Um, today you'll hear speaking myself, um, Lana Earl, and uh, Beth Nazio will also be speaking a little bit, and of course we have the team in the room to help uh, with questions and answers, and then we'll go around the room and you'll hear who is here. So again, Lana Earl. I'm Jill Parnell with Erica Rosa Galiga from the Northeast Center. Stacey Wicker from the Northeast Center. Anne Marie Todd, four time TBI survivor, waiver uh, advocate, and participant. <laughs> Jim Harlow, Sunshine Home Care. Jesse Weiner, family member of a consumer. Uh, Sagan Rockenstein with the Center for Disability Services. Meg Everett with Leading Age New York. Beth Nazio from the Department of Health. I put them up there, uh, the dates up there on the screen for you folks, really beginning in January when we originally got our reprieve and extension um, for meeting the CMS COI requirements until um, January 1st, uh, 2021. Um, and we've had a, a few very good sessions, I think, where we were able to discuss um, what potential options are for us. Uh, becoming compliant with the CMS COI rules. Um, at our last meeting, which was in May, um, seems like a long time ago, but not really, right? Um, we also uh, invited our uh, colleagues from uh, CMS to participate in the call as well. Um, and, you know, to provide all of you um, an opportunity to directly interface with CMS on some of your thinking and thoughts around what uh, potential COI solutions um, we could uh, collectively uh, implement. Um, and, you know, I think we tried really hard to uh, think how we could uh, avoid a sort of a separation of uh, service coordination from uh, the waiver services. And I think, you know, what really has emerged um, from those conversations are really kind of three approaches that I think we can all implement that are uh, compliant with COI. So, um, you know, the, the, those models or service delivery or service provisioning, whatever the right words are that you want to use, could be that, you know, a provider would offer service coordination only. That would be uh, a provider who would be compliant. Somebody who offers uh, waiver services only, and we'll talk about what waiver services are, uh, that little asterisk, right? Some of the waiver services that are under both uh, the umbrellas of each waiver are not uh, subject to COI. We don't have to worry about them when we think about COI, so we'll talk a little bit about that. 
And then we have, of course, that a provider could offer both service coordination and waiver services that are subject to COI, as long as they don't provide service coordination and a waiver service to the same individual, right? So that's that's the roadmap that we have. Um, I, I don't know of any other model that we discussed that meets the COI requirements. Um, if folks think there are others and want to shoot me a note or raise that topic, we can. Um, I think um, we're kind of at a juncture that it is now August, um, and I think we had committed to CMS to sort of lock down our decision like in June, sort of a little bit behind the curve. Um, and I think as we had talked at the past meetings, one of the concerns is just making sure that we have a sufficient lead time on the calendar, meaning between now and 1121, to implement in a way that is as smooth as possible um, and in a way that DOH can be uh, as helpful as possible. Um, and Part of what we'll talk about today is how I think that we can be helpful uh, to you all as individual providers who are going to be making some decisions, and then how we can work together to have you folks share your at least initial thinking on what you may do um, to become compliant, because it will be important for us to roll those decisions up across the state and see how that impacts uh, the landscape of how services are provided today and who receives them and where. So I'm going to talk to you a lot today, the first half of our meeting, about um, some data that we put together. I think um, I talked to the Alliance um, over the summer, uh, I forget when that was, June or so, um, and I also talked to a few of you individually about um, doing a survey of providers and their thinking. And the more that I had thought about that and the more that I chatted about that with folks and with the team, um, we came up with what we think is a, a better approach that is really data-driven um, and that will allow us to both look at today and then look at, as folks make decisions, how things may or may not change and then really be able to drill down to impacts on individuals um, as well as providers. And that will be important to all of us to make sure that there is a, a smooth transition uh, as we move to meet the CMS requirements. I have a question. Sure. Um, this may be going right back to basics again because I was thinking about this at, once I heard about the, once I got the email no notice. Uh, can someone explain, having been on the waiver for, thankfully, for many, many years, mm -hmm. what instigated, what um, triggered uh, this whole new uh, model? Does anybody have a... So, my understanding is, and it's been in place since March 17th of... 2014. 2014. The conflict of interest has been? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And we have, we have been... We've received extensions from CMS around since that time, uh, effectively around implementing it. And my understanding is from CMS that it was driven by uh, across the country. There were folks who were consumers, stakeholders, and others who were raising issues about there being conflicts of interest uh, in service provision. Uh, particularly for folks who are providing service coordination and other services, steering of you know, services to members. And in response to that, CMS uh, went through what I understand is a very lengthy process where they uh, proposed a regulation, they received uh, public comment, and then they moved forward with a final recommendation that uh, requires the conflict of interest requirements be met for uh, HCBS services that are provided uh, under waivers. So, okay, this is a, a two-prong thought here. Then, just a couple of years ago, with the particular agency that I was working under, I was receiving both service coordination and ILST mm -hmm. in the same, and that was for quite a few years. Now, mm -hmm. if it's gone into effect since 2014... We haven't implemented. 
Oh, so we've had all these things. Federal government put the war into effect. Yeah. And they gave us a pass. They, they allowed us, they, they, we'd been on a, a reprieve or an extension or whatever word you want to use. We're in a transition period. We're in a transition period. And, and, and what we learned in the fall of last year, right, was that we are on our last extension, um, graciously uh, given by CMS. Um, and with some pointed conversations around a reluctant extension and that we really need to move forward with compliance. And so those were the conversations that we started to have with you uh, in December and January of, December of last year and January of this year. So the comments that you had been picking up along the way of the conflict of interest, was that meaning that whomever these folks were, uh, that they weren't putting the client first, that they had a, an, an element of the business or obviously there's a business behind it of that you have to make a living with it and make a, a livable wage with it, understandably so. Um, I'm just wondering whether that conflict was someone putting their business needs before the patient, before, before the client, mm -hmm. uh, that was a beginning seed for why the conflict of interest came up? So I, I, I don't know the answer of, you know, of all of the array of providers who may have been engaged or not engaged in uh, behavior that would have not met conflict of interest requirements. I think what CMS has said is we are going to require a, a service delivery model under the waivers that from their perspective, ensures uh, that there will not be uh, conflicts of interest in the provisioning of the services, and released the reg and said, anybody who wants to do, you know, be a provider and provide these services would need to meet um, these requirements. Because uh, in previous meetings, I was amused and delighted that your. Um, uh, graphics. Well, we have some. <laughs> oh, you have some more. Okay. <laughs> go, go ahead to the, I, I can show you some graphics. We have some. Um, this is the first one. There's another one, Amory, that you're probably thinking of. Um, so, um, sorry, the color's a little. Um, but within the waiver services, um, Beth and her good work in thinking got CMS to agree that some of the waiver services really does not make a lot of sense to apply COI rules to. And so those are the ones that are in green, and essentially it's the assistive technology, the moving assistance, the uh, community transitional services, um, the, the, the meals, and uh, environmental modifications uh, in the NHTD okay. waiver, and then those same services, the three that also appear in TDI. All the rest of the services that are showing up in blue um, are ones that we need to make sure that we have a compliant uh, service provisioning for. Um, the, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit uh, uh, more about um, that in just a second. So why don't we go ahead to the next slide. So Amory, these, the, the, these are the diagrams, right? Yes, out of vote copyrighted, correct. Um, so um, you've seen the diagram on the left before, and the one on the right is just um, really adding the the, the models that are uh, naturally compliant. So starting on the left, um, if you're provider A and you're providing, and you offer both service coordination and direct waiver services, you can only provide one of those to participant A. In this case, provider A has chosen to provide per, per, participant A service coordination. That means by definition, another provider um, would need to provide participant A any waiver services um, that they uh, may need. Um, and again, so providers can provide both, right? So it is and does not, it's not a model that says you cannot provide both. You can provide both, you just cannot provide it to the same service. If you are, or excuse me, person, thank you. If you are um, providing service coordination, and I don't think this is even potential, but if you're providing service coordination and one of those exempt waiver services that is in green that we just talked about, that's okay, right? Because those are exempt, no worries. Um, 
And then on the, on the right is the sort of naturally compliant, right? If you're just providing service coordination, there's no way you could have a conflict of interest uh, issue under the provisions, right? Or if you're just providing waiver services, again, there isn't any way that you could uh, have a conflict. Um, both of those participants um, would then receive their required service coordination, obviously, from another uh, provider. Um, and then we just have a little note there to remind folks about what the exempt waiver services are that we just uh, talked about on the previous slide that was highlighted in green. So that's our um, landscape. Um, questions? Anyone in the room? On the line? Um, folks are asking about slides. We'll definitely um, get slides to you. I apologize. You will never get slides from me before a meeting because I work on them right up until the meeting, which I did today too. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be better at that, but I, I'm not good at that. Um, so we will get uh, the slides around to folks um, after the meeting today. Okay. Um, next steps. So we'd like to continue our collaboration and working uh, through the implementation of uh, the COI um, uh, rules. January 1st, 2021 is the day. We need to be fully compliant in our operations by that day. So we have, you know, I don't know how many months, 15 months or something like that to uh, get it done. I think a key goal, I think for all of us, right, is assuring that we have access to all waiver services and that folks have access to service coordination. Um, and I, I think, and we talked a little bit about this, um, and as we move through the data, I think maybe you'll see a little bit about kind of where I'm hoping folks will come with me and think. Right, so in this, there could be uh, opportunities for folks. And I think if we can sh collectively work together to share information um, around folks' thoughts, um, that can also kind of provide a feedback loop for us where opportunities might emerge where, uh, as folks make decisions. Um, and we'll be looking at that closely. And again, our thinking was how can we communicate data and information to providers that has folks and gives folks the ability to think about opportunities. And in order to do that, we kind of need to have some, you know, statewide data. So that's what we'll, we'll show you. So what we did is we went into the claims database and we, by rate code, by service, and we looked at um, claims for all the providers um, by uh, county and county was defined by the member. Um, and uh, we looked at who's providing service coordination, who's providing what we've now called exempt and non-exempt services. We've looked at unique members associated with that. And then we also looked at um, uh, the, the, the resources, the dollars um, received um, from, those, uh, from those services. Um, and you know, what will that do? It's going to do a lot of things. I didn't even attempt to list them all here, but certainly it will tell us, you know, who is compliant today and who isn't, because um, we're drilling down right to the unique member. Um, whether we can avail ourselves to any of the rural or cultural exemptions, um, I continue to hope that there might be some. Um, Probably not, um, but I don't want to rule it out and I want to continue to keep it uh, on a page. We're just not seeing that in the data, um, but we should continue to uh, think about that. Um, and again, help you all think about um, your uh, options for compliance. Um, and then, importantly, keep us uh, connected with you all and providers and recipients to make sure that as we transition, we uh, make sure that everybody has uh, access and that we can actively, proactively work to um, address issues. All right, so this is hard to see. Can you make it as big as you can? Can you hide the, I don't know if you can. Yeah, I made that bit. That's it. So, okay. You should have brought you guys hard copies. Um, so what you see on the screen, and, and our plan, um, I'll, I'll say it now, I think it's in the slide. Full screen? 
Hang on, folks on the phone. We're just trying to make it a little bigger. You can probably zoom in. Yeah. You might then have to scroll, but you can keep zooming. In. Or else you can even do zoom to. Yeah. And then we'll have to just scroll around. So folks, we, we're making the screen as big as we can for folks in the room. Um, so we can't see your questions at the moment, but we will, we will go back to that. All right, so it's a little better, right? Okay. So um, and you will get these slides um, so we can go through. So and what our plan is, is to give... Um, is to give each provider um, this exact data. So we will distribute to every provider this data. We're gonna, we'll provide roll-up data to folks um, of their data. Now, you all have this as providers, I know, right? Um, but we'll give you what we're looking at because I wanna make sure we're communicating in the same way. This data is obviously, um, a little bit old, right? It's from April. It, we collect the data from the last fiscal year. Um, so it backs up from April 18 through March of 19. Um, so folks here who pluck data for us, right, they, they don't like to go back much. They, they like to have a six month gap in between uh, the date that they pluck it to make sure that there is, you know, claims run out and it's fairly accurate. So that's why we pick that data, not so much because it's a fiscal year, but um, because of that. Um, and so on, uh, on, on the screen, so this, this, this data is sliced by provider and it's, um, let's, we'll say it's provider ABC. Um, and this shows that provider, where provider ABC and what counties it serves members. So this particular provider um, serves a lot of counties and you can see them listed on the side. And the green block shows the amount of uh, unique recipients that it provides uh, service coordination only to. Um, and also has the revenues um, from providing service coordination only. So for this provider ABC, they provide 15 unique recipients uh, service coordination only and they receive $39,000 roughly for that. And that's 95% of the revenues they receive from the work that they do in Broome County. So that percentage is, and you can see there's a little formula there, column A divided by column E. Column E is all the way to the right, which is the sum of the revenues in that county. And then the next block is the orange is shaded color. Third one is the uh, exempt services, just to give you the, the ideas that the provider would see their full revenue accounted for, right? So we're just showing you those exempt and then you can make decisions right about, about those. So those are there. And then the, the last uh, column in that sort of pinkish color um, is um, where this particular provider, ABC, um, and shows obviously in what county, how many unique recipients it has that it is providing both service coordination and labor services to. And so you can see where we've highlighted in red, those are the members and the services that are conflicted, for lack of a better word, today, and don't, would be uh, members and service provisioning profiling, right, for those folks that don't, um, are, that are not compliant. So, as you can see, if we do this sort of exercise across the state, um, we can begin to see, you know, how many providers are uh, wholly compliant today, how many providers are, you know, have a mix of members that some are compliant for, some are not, where are they, who are they? What are they getting? 
right? And then, um, so those are all the, all the, all, plus I think we can also drill down into, it's not here, but, yeah. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So um, that's the kind of data by provider. And then we can also look at, which will become important as people make decisions, right? Um, you know, I think you all work in your, in the, in the regions that we have. We've drilled down to counties so that we can be a little bit more refined in our thinking. Um, but, so this shows same data, but by county. And it looks at every provider in all of our counties, right? So this would be County X. Um, I don't know what county this is, but, um, and it shows for example, in County X, there's 14 providers providing services, and then it goes through the same buckets and slices and dices of information, um, and then you get over to the right, and we can see that, you know, which providers are operating in which counties for how many people and where they might have, or where they do, right, have. So I'm going to take a pause for um, folks in the room um, and folks on the line who might have some questions, and we can go back to the data slides and bring them up, but we just need to um, bring back the, the questions. Any questions in the room? From how you position the data, mm -hmm. it would seem to me that there could be some natural partnering that could occur in some of those ages. Would that be an acceptable solution from conflict of interest point of view? So that's a great question, and that's why I'm really hoping that the lens is opportunities and partnerships. Um, <laughs> I want to get folks the data, mm -hmm. and I think another step here is sort of providing some rolled up data. So I think we need a second meeting, right? Um, that kind of does that. You know, we won't be calling out specific providers by name or anything like that, but I think we need to sort of, and we can landscape that out. The, the part, we have to just make sure, because we talked a little bit about this when we were looking at various models, we just need to make sure that the partnerships that could get formed or the opportunities that folks might be able to think about as they look at regions and where where services are needed, don't run afoul of steering, right? Mm -hmm. Or, um, but yes, I, I think that is exactly what I'm hoping that people think about and how they think about this. And we want to be as helpful in that endeavor as possible, um, and are happy to have meetings with folks, engage folks on their thinking. Um, you know, if we have data and can share it, we will. Um, and this will be a good start starting point. Um, our goal is to have um, the data um, out to folks not later than the first week of September. So we're probably around 95% done of all this data crunching that we've been doing. And folks have been putting uh, a lot of time on it. And we've done a QA on it uh, to make sure that it's you know accurate and reflects the claims database. Um, across the department. Um, and so that will be our goal. And everybody, if you are in both waivers, you will get two spreadsheets. If you're not, you'll get one. Um, and we'll show you your, your just like what you see on the screen. Um, do you have a total? So do you know how many clients are in total conflict in the full universe of total conflict? I, or full no, because I don't have the final, final data. I don't. I didn't even. I, we didn't get that. We didn't far get that far. Yeah. So all I have right now is one, one slice of this for one of the waiver programs. So once we did the QA and got it good, we're going to duplicate the analysis for the second waiver program. So I don't have that answer. But that is. That's, that's why. Our goal. That's our goal. And that's why I think we need to. Once the data comes pushes out in September. We'll have another session like this so that we can roll up the data and have that conversation with you folks about, okay, here's what we're seeing. You all have your individual data, right? Here's what we're seeing. You know, X amount of providers are fully compliant today, and here's where they're at, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then that will allow folks to, I think, begin that thinking. 
And I'd like to have a window of time where maybe folks are being, you know, I guess the ask is let's be thoughtful about how we decide. And clearly it's not our decision, so I want to be clear about that. I'm not, um, I, I fully understand that, you know, it'll be a decision that is made by providers. But I think we all share the common goal, you know, of making sure that there is access, right, for folks and that we've got, is, you know, uh, continuity of at least the service, right? Um, and that we and Beth and the team and I can, um, you know, kind of have a plan B. Um, and, you know, I, I talked a little bit about plan B with some of you about kind of what can we do here. And until we sort of, you know, congeal a little bit around what the landscape might look like, then we can kind of sort of start to strategically address, you know, together uh, is the preference, right, um, the, the issues that might arise. It's getting to your point too, Jim, is once we get past all of the data, uh -huh. and then we come to an agreement as to how we can proceed. So for example, like the issue that you present in terms of cooperative relationships, we have to use the next year to actually get to the actual protocols to how those relationships will work, how we get to implementation, and then with the expectation that we're converted by January 1 of 2021, so that by then we're fully compliant. So that's a lot of territory to get through in the next few months. Well, you, you correctly assumed part two of my question, which is could we be getting some legal guidance from DOH in terms of what the firewalls would need to look like for those kind of partnerships to have things be in compliance so. yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, roughly, right, I really think we need a, a, you know, at least 12 months to kind of post sort of here's where we're all going to land to actually implement. So what that backs into is us getting through all this conversation by, uh -huh. you know, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and so pushing the data out in September, quickly following up with that, with this sort of, you know, here's the, you know, rolled up universe, and then beginning those conversations with the goal of getting to a steady state from providers on where they're headed by that time. So I think we have a few questions on the line. Uh, what are some cultural exemption examples? Um, so that could be that um, maybe there is a provider who um, serves, uh, I think there's a couple of cultural examples, Chinese American providers who speak uh, certain language, serve a certain constituency, or serve a constituency in a manner that meets their cultural preferences um, are examples. Um, there could be others. Um, those are the, the ones I'm familiar with in other parts of healthcare um, in, in, in DOH. Um, and if those are uh, out there, and we can we can avail ourselves to those exemptions. We would certainly have a conversation with CMS about here's what it, they'll want to know to, but um, here's what we think is a cultural exemption. Um, in in that case, what, what else we got? We got a couple more miles. Is there a plan? Is that where we're at? Yep. Is there a plan for when there are no providers left to provide LST and uh, service coordination services? Are we already seeing providers discontinue these services? Um, I have not received any droves of people raising their hand to provide to discontinue services. Um, part of why we thank you. Part of why we want to. Um, do this work with you in collaboration is so that we can collectively identify where this may or may not happen and then problem solve. I can't answer that question today because I would need all the information from riders about what it is that they're thinking. So that's what we're starting today, um, you know, knowing what our choices and options for models that are compliant are. Um, and we'll work through that together, which is why we want to get done by the end of December so we have as much time as possible to identify where we may have uh, access for uh, service capacity. Uh, right, on the same on that question, mm -hmm. who's responsible then for guaranteeing continuation services? Is Department of Health? 
we, we have an obligation to meet the requirements of the waiver. So, you know, I think where we have service gaps, and if we have service gaps, and again, I'm hoping that we are all strategic together and that we get well, I through hope that. So too, yeah. um, but yes, I think we, we need, if we want to provide services under the terms of the waiver, which we do, we need to uh, make sure that we're compliant. So that exercise will be going on. And we'll also be engaging our partners at CMS in what does it look like? Where are we? We have vulnerabilities here. What can we do, right? They're our partner here. So we will keep them uh, fully engaged in our progress and our discussions um, as we go uh, and certainly consult them, right, on uh, where we have issues. And we're going to work to continue to expand the provider base as well. So yeah. we, we have constantly new providers applying. So we're, we're looking at that as well. Yeah. Okay. I mean, to rephrase what I'm saying, I don't want to see, I hope that on January 1st, 2021, okay, the service coordinator doesn't say, hey, I can't provide that service for you anymore, okay, because I'm providing other services, mm -hmm. okay, and then we don't have service coordinators. Well, that, that's, that's the, that is the concern, right? right? And, you know, here's our path today to be as proactive together in ensuring that that doesn't happen and then making sure we have other paths, other providers potentially, right? I think, I think the struggle we're in right now is if, you know, you called up somebody and said, hey, have I got a deal for you. Please come provide service coordination. They would say, where and how many? And I would say, don't know. So I think part of today, I would say, don't know, right? But part of the collaboration and the dialogue between now and the end of the year will help us answer those questions with you folks and presumably strategically, and then be able to uh, engage in other paths to um, fill the gaps if there are gaps. Exactly. At one point, you, we had talked about having a state agency mm -hmm. doing service coordination. Mm -hmm. So that might be necessary mm -hmm. to, like you say, fill the gaps, okay? Please have those things yeah. on the plan for that. Yeah, I, I, I'm in a, not... It doesn't help me now to presuppose, right, a bunch of potential solutions without gathering the data. And so I want to be strategic about it. We need to gather the data, and then we need to figure out what is um, the right solution. But those are all clearly options, right, for uh, making sure that we uh, provide access. We do have some more questions. Okay. Is it just two questions? Yeah. Um, two questions. This is from um, someone on the line. Uh, challenging clients with not more challenging clients with not more than one agency willing to work with them that only have one option. Is there a plan to increase requirements for uh, service coordinators? Can I ask? So. Um, why don't we come back to this? Because part of, I think, a little bit about what you're raising today, um, what you're raising in that question, um, relates to the second part of our conversation around uh, qualifications um, for mm -hmm. um, service provision. Um, so we can come back to that. Um, it's, can you turn on the, it won't go away, right, Randy? Uh, we could come back to Randy um, at, the, at the end. Um, So we will provide um, some rolled up data, county by county, um, subsequent to the distribution of the individual data uh, to the provider. Okay. All right. So, so I think a lot of questions are coming around qualifications. So let's move forward um, and we can come back uh, at the end and try to open lines. Um. As agencies start reconfiguring and perhaps partnering with others, mm -hmm. will there be a fast track if new agencies become developed through those partnerings 
that would bring in the qualified qualifications for the waiver. In terms of the application mm -hmm. process, Jim? Yeah. So, can you, I didn't hear it all. Can you repeat so, the question? So, the Jim presents the, the issue that, say, as Sunshine seeks to partner with another provider, a new provider, mm -hmm. is will there be a mechanism to fast track their provider enrollment process? And, and actually, we've started to work on that already. Jim, we just had a, um, a conference call with the RDCs this week to try to get the, usually the biggest impediment to our getting new providers on is the delay associated with getting the provider IDs out of the Medi shop, because that's a, generally a 90-day period. So we're now trying to work out a system where as soon as a provider sends us a, a letter of intent, they also begin their eMedni application, um, and so that we at least know who's in the works and, and so that we can help facilitate the process. So we've actually started working on some of those issues already. Great. Yeah, we, we, again, and we will do whatever we can um, to help, and that's a perfectly good question and example, and we would work to... Uh, Obviously, it's a tight timeline. Yes, exactly, right. Okay. So, um, again, at, at, at our kind of prior meetings, we also, as we were thinking about models, the question was, what are some other things, right, we can do programmatically, for lack of a better way to say it, um, that can help us um, deal with some of the issues as we transition. And one of the things that we, we, we did mention in a a while ago, and Beth and her team has been thinking about it, is the issue around staff qualifications. Um, you can go to the next slide. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Beth, but I think generally the idea here is just to set the stage a little bit, right? We've had a history where we had qualifications, we changed those qualifications in both of the waivers in um, 17 and 18, and I think one of the things that we've been hearing from folks is that that uh, has made finding folks uh, to, to fulfill some of these roles a challenge. But I do want to be very pointed when I say this, and very, um, because it's an important issue. We need to think about qualifications, and we're happy to think about uh, amending them further and adjusting them and working with our partners at CMS to do that. But we have to be thoughtful, and we have to make sure that we are comfortable. And this is really a question for all of you, and less for me, because I certainly, and, and many of us here who have helped administer the program with you all. But clearly we want to make sure that the, the, the services are being provided are being provided by folks who are capable, right? Um, and that can deliver the service uh, in the quality way that is expected, uh, you know, for the services and for the member. So I, 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 this is not just an exercise of let's change qualifications to increase the labor pool. We all agree, and hopefully that that is the goal, but it comes from a point of view of still ensuring, right, that there is the qualifications there to deliver the service as it's intended and in a quality way, right? So, um, and, I, and the last thing just to remind folks is, so today our goal is to give you some thoughts that we have on some changes we can make that Beth and the team here has thought really hard about. They're, they're for your consideration. We would like your feedback. We're not saying this is it, right? We are sharing with you some thoughts that we have. We will need to take it to CMS. They'll have to be our partner and approve it. So even what we say, even what we think today um, is we're putting here for folks' consideration and feedback, um, you know, would need to be uh, reviewed and vetted um, with CMS. But our first step today is giving you some thoughts to get your feedback, right? And uh, I think there's even a couple where we're just saying, what do you guys think? Um, and, and offering you uh, our thoughts. So just want to be clear that this, this is a proposal for consideration uh, and open to uh, stakeholder feedback. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Beth and her team who will walk you through um, some of our thinking here. This is that when we, when we did the, the new applications, we were anticipating that we would be moving to managed care. 
and many of our, our staff qualifications were adjusted with the intent that they would be more compatible with the managed care environment than they were with the existing waiver environment at the time. So as a result, there was a significant change in, in the qualifications. Additionally, what we were seeking to resolve was, if you recall, in the old um, staff qualifications, there was a, like a, a Chinese menu of staff qualifications. If you were in category A and supervised by somebody in category B, you, you know, it was okay. If you were in category C, you didn't need any additional supervision. Um, and what we found was is that uh, that got very difficult for some of the providers to translate. Um, and as, re as a result, when we were finding that OMIG audits were occurring, that usually one of the largest deficiencies was in staff qualifications. If a service is provided by a non-qualified staff, that service is a, it cannot be billed for. Um, and as such, a lot of our providers were experiencing significant audit issues because of uh, a misunderstanding of who could do what functions and who needed to be supervised by whom. So when we went in, into the next application process, we worked very hard to try to eliminate the A, B, and C categories. Um, as a result, uh, because of the fact that we were eliminating that level of extra supervision or a mandatory supervision circumstance, um, it bumped up the qualifications to pretty much what was considered to be the supervisor level. Um, and that's what providers are expressing is creating a lot of problems because particularly with the job market being what it is, as competitive as it is, um, and the fact that uh, we have a, a, a pretty specialized service population um, and some very specific qualifications, it's been extremely difficult to actually recruit new, new staff. Um, so what we did was is we went back and looked at the qualifications from the 2010 application, the qualifications uh, from the 2018 application, now this would be NHPD, and then came up for with some additional um, changes that we think might help to resolve these issues. Additionally, um, and CMS gets very upset when we refer to grandfathering in, they don't like us to use that term, um, so we try to avoid it. What we, we put in the existing uh, applications is language that basically said that if a waiver participant, uh, per, a waiver staff person was currently working for a provider and they met the old qualifications, they were allowed to continue that employment. However, if they were to change employers, their, their, their previous history would not be considered and they would have to pre present themselves to that new employer using the new qualifications. Um, and as a result, there were a lot of staff that could not move from one agency to another, um, and they were sort of dead-end into a particular provider because they did not meet the new qualification. So the first thing that we're proposing is, is that for any current staff person who's currently employed with a provider who meets the old qualifications and has continued their employment with that provider, we would, we're proposing to CMS, so what we will do is issue a certificate to that individual that basically said they were previously employed providing waiver services and that they should continue to provide waiver services and as such they'll, be, uh, they'll have a certificate that they can present to the new employer which will allow them mobility within the service system by, by uh, providers. Now what we're thinking is, is going forward obviously there are some folks that like to follow their service coordinator in terms of waiver participants. That affords the participants some additional choices in terms of should a, a, a particular service coordinator leave who doesn't meet the current qualifications, at least the participant will be given the choice to follow that particular service coordinator. So that's the first general sort of uh, proposal we're, we're presenting uh, that we're going to move forward with. Additionally, what we are suggesting is for NHTD in terms of service coordination that we provide for um, an associate's degree and five years experience providing case management service, service coordination, um, information linkages, referrals, community-based services uh, with, with people with disabilities and or seniors. Mm -hmm. So we're adding to the role of the service coordinator the ability that we would be able to bring on folks with an associate's degree um, as, and five years experience 
um, as an additional uh, qualification. Um, and again, these folks we were suggesting are not going to require any other additional supervision than what the other, the other service coordinators are getting. So there's not a, an imposition on the provider to have to provide any additional administrative support to those folks, that they're just going to qualify as service coordinators. Any feedback on that? I think that helps a lot. Do you? Yeah. It's good to hear. The reality is social workers don't go to social work school to become service coordinators in case not. They, they end up in those kinds of jobs but uh, and then get experience, but they don't, they don't, nobody goes to school for that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I, that I think, though, it's great to add your associates. It's really good to my possibility. I think the years of experience is it's difficult. It's difficult to ask about the five years. Because, well, they have three years for bachelor's, and I assume you have two for the associates because you're taking away the two-year degree. But I think we still, even with the bachelor's in three years, it's very hard, especially at the compensation rate that you can pay. And there's this old legacy of you can't count the internship hours as credit towards experience. Mm -hmm. and very hard to find people who have a bachelor's degree in three years that want to come. It's, it's, it, that's, it, that is the years of experience I think is a challenge. You also, so can't, is there something that you also could, can't count hours with working with children either. It's got to be it adult to hours. Be, well, you have to, well we, we've said individuals with disabilities. Yeah, you, okay. you can figure out something, but if you're looking at someone who's a new grad or has done something or maybe they did something during school, it's still very hard to find because this is kind of an entry level position for a lot of people to be mm -hmm. experienced and we're asking them to come to the table with Maybe one year would be some. I know that we want something so that they're not totally green, but three, it's, a, it's a big question. Yes. From a consumer point of view, I'd like to make a point that they, I don't care how many years of experience these people have, it's more important they understand the waiver system, know what's available, okay, and how to serve, okay, the clients, okay, than what they learned in college or in a classroom. And again, I don't even bring someone in five years experience and they have a great resume, they don't understand the waiver system. They have no hope. I put something in there about training on the waiver system. Yeah, so you're right about that, Jesse. And we are looking at the at the training circumstance as a separate as a separate issue. Um, we're gonna be going forward with the changes that we're making to the program manual. We're also gonna be changing the training requirements um, because uh, the other thing I'm very sensitive to is the issue that we're looking at our, our, our forms and our service system with the idea of we also know that a lot of the agencies are incurring a lot of overtime um, and we're trying to find ways to streamline. So, for example, staff sitting in training uh, sessions can also incur an overtime situation if they're also providing services. So we have, we're also looking at the training as a completely separate and distinct issue. So we're going to be looking at the training component as well. The other issue that comes into play when we're talking about service coordinators is the whole issue of the development of the service plan and the ability to write an effective service plan. So the problem that we have is, is that if you're a service coordinator that really can't write a good service plan, you're not doing yourself a favor and you're not doing the participant a favor because what ends up happening is significant delays in the development and implementation of that plan. So additionally, we're looking at the system from the side of the form side to see how we can make our forms more effective so that they also meet the needs of the, the, the qualifications of the person as well. But um, the, the main reason why that experience is in there is so that we know that folks are able to recommend the appropriate links and networks for the participant as they're developing the service plan. And the question becomes, can someone with lesser experience be able to do that on behalf of the individual. That's a, that's a point that I wanted to bring up, that there needs to be a combination, especially for, um, a I'll use myself as an example, that um, the older that we, that we get within our, our injury, that certainly we understand better what our, what our quirks are and what our hiccups are, that when it comes to, and when we, and, and during the day when we start to fatigue, our decision making and our efforts to make anything happen in a proficient manner starts to uh, decrease. That having that person who is experienced, who uh, recognizes what those uh, displays are, <laughs> in addition to having the training 
of how the waiver and have how all the, the different programs that are available that would be applicable to uh, the participant that there needs to be a very proficient marriage of both. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, and having the um, higher education uh, simply means that it translates that the person is serious about being in this field, that uh, everyone that I've ever worked with, I've always thanked them for wanting to be a part of this, uh, this field, that we, a lot of us don't present as an easy person because there's a lot of guessing or a lot of probing and a lot of time invested into getting to know what our, because some of us don't have the ability to um, uh, articulate what's going on. It's more by our actions and our behaviors, and that takes time to, um, uh, to recognize and to pull all that together. So it's... Um, the, um, and I guess, I don't know whether this it's a topic that's going to come up in this conversation yet. That's why I am desperately missing my uh, ILST. Yep, when we're going to get, get there. there. I, figured <laughs> I, I was hoping as much. Let me get back to Jen's point. So your, your suggestion is, is that five years is too much experience. Yeah, I think in the old, I mean, I guess. So what we would be doing, if we drop down to the three, the requirement for the would be the same for the associates as it would be for the bachelors. Could you reduce the bachelors to one year? I guess one point That's that I didn't master's master's just, to, one year. just to follow on, and I'm sure you have it somewhere, but you have people who are supervised by a supervisor. This is where you used to get the A and the B. Mm -hmm. But you do have capacity in agencies to bring some of that experience and mentor people along to become good service providers because they have the right personality, they have the right compassion, and they're not the right necessary experience. And so, you know, without going back to sort of the exact old way that it was, but there was more flexibility for people who had that supervisor and had resources to help that person versus someone who's literally working independently who does have to have, I think, a little bit more under their belt to, to provide service for them. So, you know, here I think you're having it if they're employed. So I would. Well, on that note, you also bring up an interesting point because right now we're not allowing the internship in the student teaching. So what if we were to include the, allow the internship time and the student teaching time as experience time and drop down the four as a compromise? Think associates. about that. Yes. Yeah, on the associates. Yeah. I think any reduction is great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm I not sure someone with an associate's degree necessarily gets a good internship. Well, they do. Well, well, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm... <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, well, I, do think, I think doing... we have to go back and look at the internship and the student teaching. Experience. I think if you just change, that would be great. I mean, I think it will, it will extend on the associate side. All right, and then let's see what sort of feedback we get on the five. Yeah. Okay? Let me ask something. Being the service coordinator, they do a lot of interactions with the RRDC. Correct. Okay? Could it be maybe that, I don't care if you say three or five years, but given RRDC a capability for making exceptions? Okay, to these rules? No, we're not able to do that, Jesse, because CMS requires with, right within our content of our application what the qualifications are. And to try to go, I'm, I'm telling you right now, the problem that you have is, is once you start doing exceptions and people move from one employer to the next, um, it becomes a, a real big audit issue. Okay. All right, so we'll go back, we'll look at that. All right. And I think um, you're not changing the no, because you know what happened, Jim? When we went back and did the COI KIPS and looked at all of that information, there's virtually very few, I, I know of one or two providers who are actually maximizing the caseloads. No one's maximizing it's the caseload. It's yeah. very hard. <laughs> so I, I don't think I recommend it. I yeah. just want to make sure you work. <laughs> yeah, I don't see any need to do that. And then I would say, we didn't talk about training, but maybe when we get there, we could revisit what the qualifications are because I think the waivers are unique in terms of what we're asking service coordinators to do. And there's a lot of discussion somewhat on the plan writing, but I would say anyone who does service coordination is going to tell you that's sort of like a semantic fraction of what they're doing in terms mm -hmm. of the practical stuff and sort of that resource allocation, crisis management, managing doctor's appointments, understanding medications. I mean, we ask people who are doing like this whole thing to know so much about a lot of different things, and it's very hard to find like the person who has that. And could perhaps there be some training modules that give some context for anybody to come in, you have this baseline and then you get this added to just give more flexibility here. Okay.
Like you used to have for the behavior, you know, when you went through training. And yeah. You know, I'm not proposing that sense of Yeah, because we're not going to be have those sorts of resources right. available to you as well. But there are a lot of supplemental things that people can get training on that are not necessarily college degree that help on that area. And I understand, Beth, I understand the point where you're coming from of some maintenance associates in the service plan writing and it becomes more of a hassle than being productive. But could it also be explored like with the having a look at the internship and the student teaching or whatnot, that for people who have been in this field for like 18 years providing direct care, mm -hmm. they have experience working in the field, they, they've worked with people with disabilities, could work experience related to direct care be considered? Because I know people who have been in this field for 18 some odd years only with an associate's degree, but were a case manager for two, two years. No, I would say that that's particularly important with ILST qualifications. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm not quite sure what we're getting at. You're thinking you would have an associate's degree and maybe 20 years as a direct care worker, but not as a, not as like a service coordinator. Okay. Not the years of experience, just the qualification of case management. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I don't know that, the, all right. I think that's a language issue more than anything else. We, we could certainly improve the like more experience in working with people with, people with disabilities. Listen, I don't want to belong here at this point, but. No, it's an important issue. When you're on the front lines, you're dealing with the service coordinator, mm -hmm. okay? I think most of you guys are looking at the service coordinator from writing the plans and getting people approved into it. Whereas I see my service coordinator now, okay, the person who has to call Medicaid transportation, stay on the phone <laughs> for an hour to arrange a ride to a doctor, yeah. okay? <laughs> so in that case, I mean, that's a waste of, you know, a high-level person. So there's different aspects to it that I'm not sure, I'm just saying this is what the reality is, okay? Not every, a service coordinator is not always writing service plans. And you see, I'm not sure how CMS is looking at the role of a service coordinator, but there's a lot, of, lot to it, okay? And some of it doesn't require high skills, and some of it requires very specialized skills. Well, as you know from our prior, from our prior uh, discussions with CMS, the, the definition of case management as it's included in the federal rate is very broad. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the problem. I mean, the expectation is, is that basically a service coordinator should be ready and willing to do it all. The problem is, is that we have to be able to meet the high end of the need spectrum versus the lower end of the need spectrum um, and find a, a, a sort of across, across the board qualified individual. So Unless you can, can you split that service somehow? I know it's a lot of work. I'm just saying this. You know, I, but I would say now would not be the time to right. do that. Well, I'm, just saying, but I'm just telling you in general what happens, yeah. though. Okay? Yeah, I think you talk about being overloaded, and part of the reason why these people are overloaded is because of all the bureaucracies yeah. that they have to go through to get things done. Yeah, I, I, have to, I would suggest that we're going to have to come up with some interim measures first uh, before we're able to, to do that, because that would be a pretty significant change in the service system, and that, that would be... Uh, that was going to take time and energy away from the goal of getting to a conflict-free environment first. So, <coughs> baby okay. steps, but we'll get there. The okay. goal is the important thing is not to lose sight of the goal. No, I understand what you're yeah. saying. I'm just telling you how. No, well, it's, really, no, really, it's really a front line. It's it's a valid point. It's different than what people are thinking in these back wall, in these ivory towers. Okay, so we have a, a comment here that we have a support for the three years experience. Okay, so we've got that. Okay, so can we, any other any other comments on service coordination? And just for sake of argument, you're going to do two and you should be the same, right? Uh, yes. You have them separated. I don't want to hear any specifically said it. Like, well, I love mainly because, but no, the, same, the, the main reason why the was history, that I the know, 2010 calls are but really different. But just to make different. sure, like, on the go forward, yes. like, right, try okay. to marry those two. Yeah, no, TBI was the same thing, an associate's degree with five years. So we'll, so we'll, we'll consider TBI and NHP done for service oh, awards. Yeah. She loves to keep it on track. Yeah, just your argument. That's right. We do have one waiver. Yeah. Ice. Don't think I didn't try that. All right, so now we're moving on to CIC. All right, so. Mm -hmm. 
You okay, Tom? No. 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 we can go. Take them. She said the arrows don't work. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Oh. All right, thank God. I'm sorry. Well, I got to go. All right, so now we're moving on to CIC. Sit with your strengths, Tom. Hey. CIC. I just said that wasn't it. <laughs> CIC is an example of this is where when we looked at this in the managed care environment and you start talking about counseling, you start talking about very specific certifications and, and higher level of, of degree individuals. So, and most importantly, the big factor in all of that was moving to licensed folks. Um, and the problem is, is that we might have folks with uh, master's level in social work that are not necessarily licensed social workers, particularly since of the changes in the New York State licensure process over the years. So for CIC, we're talking about going back to just a master of social work, a master of psychology, uh, putting back in these the students, uh, teacher of students with disabilities, um, and we add we're adding master of gerontology, right? And that would be uh, and the two years experience. So basically, what we're doing is keeping CIC pretty much as is, adding in some lower level uh, credentialed individuals, and keeping the uh, experience the same. Was there, um, I don't know if, if, if this is the wrong category, uh, a few conversations ago there was a, a, a time frame of a person receiving two years or three years worth of CIC and then it would be, at the end of that term, it would be revisited. Uh, and that requirement, that's in the waiver application language, Amory, you're right, that's in there specifically. However, what folks I think have misunderstood is, is it's just that there's a reconsideration for the continued need for the service. So as long as the service coordinator significantly supports the reason why the individual continues to need the service, there is no limitation to it continuing. Okay, So that's just language that needs to be included in the service plan. And, and you're right, a lot of people panicked about that and they thought that it was being cut off. It is not. What we're just basically saying is, is that specifically when you set up counseling goals for a person and you're saying that there's been no progress in two years, we need, it's good to always document why there hasn't been a significant progress or why you haven't gotten to the point of no longer needing the service and here's the reason why you continue to need the service. That's all we're requesting. Well, that clarification is much more reassuring because uh, some of the events that I've been through, that even though I've been on it and receiving it uh, for a good chunk of time, that <clears throat> my uh, CIC has been a rock star for me continuing yep, and to that's keep gonna, me stable. And that will continue as long as she continues to write good reports as to why you continue to need the service. <laughs> and that gets us back to the whole documentation issue again. Okay. You know, if you have a good... Any comments on CIC? So let me talk, let, let's talk about that. So I have a, a master's degree in art. Does that qualify me to do counseling? There used to be a term No, I have a bachelor's in art. My master's okay. is, is a special. Oh, special. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be a term called health-related. And you know what? And you know what, Jim? We we sort of start. We looked at all of those, and the problem is, is because there was counseling and related services. And what ends up happening is, is that some of these definitions we're literally going back into the, the State Department of Ed to actually look at what the qualifications are from a from a, a graduate perspective in terms of a degree. Uh -huh. And what ends up happening is, is they get so vague that providers are bringing on folks that they think meet those qualifications. They're never really looking at the state aid qualifications for it. And as a result, they're bringing on staff that don't meet the quals, and then they're getting cited on audit. So here's the dilemma that we have. When we have a provider enrollment, 
Every provider submits one staff qualification for each service they're seeking to provide. Once that provider is approved, we do not go back and look, re look at those staff qualifications. So if you're a provider who misunderstands what those qualifications are or takes some leniency in the interpretation of those qualifications, you could be bringing on somebody that you believe is qualified that in the long run is not, and then you're going to get audited, and then you're going to end up having to pay us back a lot of money. So which we're trying to keep it as black and white as possible to really, to, in many ways, to protect you from the audit side and to ensure us on the compliance side. So, so that's what happens when we get into some of these uh, very, you know, more broad uh, sort of degrees. So the issue of uh, family counseling. Terry, did we have family counseling in there before? No, I think I don't think it was for CIC. We had at one point for a degree in a health related field. I don't think yeah. it was CIC though. Okay. It, like so I would count, you know, like the counseling degree or family right. therapy. So I would suggest that if you have other recommendations in terms of counseling related um, degrees or experience, if you could get us that information and we'll go and look them up in the Department of Ed and if they, they meet the general requirements, we'll, we'll certainly give them full consideration. Um, we do have licensed mental health practitioner, which includes family Yeah, but that's a licensed one. So. Yeah. So, that's so you're saying they need these degrees in addition to the two years of experience? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So Particularly if you have a pastor of a church for 25 years that's been doing this, it's natural, okay? Well, keep in mind, though, the, 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 Jesse, if we're looking at, say, on the, on, when we're looking at it in a waiver perspective, we're looking at it in the context of a very specialized population folks with TBI, and in, in seniors and people with disabilities. And your pastor might not have ever spoken to either one of those populations in those 20 years. They right. might have good counseling skills, but getting to Anne Marie's uh, point, they might not know that towards the end of the day, the words get a little scrambled and she gets tired and she can't keep up with the session. Yeah. So I agree, I agree with you, but I also I'm just saying yeah, that you don't know who really, in the long run, who really becomes a good resource or not, okay? Some things just come natural to some people, okay? But we, but again, keep in mind, these are not services that are provided in a, you know, a singular environment. That's what your service coordinators, and I'm gonna tell you right now, if Anne Marie gets a really bad ILST, she's gonna be on the phone, if not to me, to somebody to say, you know what, that person really stinks and doesn't understand where I'm coming from. I understand from. you need control to go on, but I'm also pointing out that, you know, the, well, the other you know, challenge is that pastoral counseling has a religious exemption and a religious focus in the time. So that's yes, and we certainly don't want to get into that. <laughs> it could be right. interesting. I mean, it could be a, a sports coach that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a life coach, yes. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. We all need life coaches. Right. I don't know what this year is going there. It says that even with the addition of more flexibility on the hiring, the rate of pay of CIC has not changed in basically 12 years except for 3%. Good luck to you guys. I mean, I see you guys go for, you know, Department of Health to hire a person with a master's degree. It's well beyond sort of what we can pay our, you know, CIC staff. So when you look at capacity and what's out there, I think a lot of it has to do with reimbursement because it's really outdated on, on these particular services. Okay. I will say noted. I mean, I know you guys want fiscal <laughs> dollars, caps, all those things, but I just have to say, you know, no, no, I, not, it'll be a capacity issue. Okay. So, um, okay, so one is duly noted in terms of Diane's basically saying that, you know, the um, associate's degree and years of experience in the field is not necessarily uh, just in case management. So we have that already. And then a master's in counseling related degree has more actual counseling classes than a special education degree. Can you explain that? this being allowed. Um, mainly because folks at home tend to have special education degrees tend to be sort of like a case manager or service coordinator and they end up being very multifaceted and it's not usually we're not usually looking at folks that are just 
uh, in a classroom setting, but in particular, we consider those folks that are in the IDD system. Uh, so individuals with developmental disabilities generally tend to have special folks with special ed background. So we were looking for some transference from that, that work, pool of workers into our service population. Um, and the clinician has a master's degree in psychology and supervised by a PhD. Are they qualified to provide CIC? They would be under the new, under the new requirements. Right. Again, th there's a question here about a lesser qualified person being supervised by a higher qualified person. This gets me back to my earlier discussion. We're trying to put a, in an environment where folks do not, don't qualify for a position if in fact they're supervised by someone from a higher level, just that everybody that's providing the service is in fact qualified. And then I'm going to confuse you because then I'm going to go on to the next slide, which is going to talk about um, PBIS, and in, in the case of PBIS, we have um, very specific requirements for the program director as well as the behavior specialist. Um, and some of this really has to go back to dealing with historically um, in terms of some of the behavioral programs that used to be available to us um, on the TBI side that then filtered into the NHTD system in terms of the service model. Um, so, and, uh, so in particular for PBIS, we do have very specific qualifications for the program director as well as the behavioral specialist, uh, mainly because what ends up happening is, is you, would, you could have a behavior specialist that's going out into the home, working directly with the individual that's writing the behavior plan, and we wanted to make sure that that plan itself is in fact monitored by the program director and signed off, so as a result, we have higher qualifications from the program director than we do for the behavior specialist. So for the program director, we're adding in a master's. Again, we're reducing some of the licensure requirements. We're going dropping back down to the master of social work, the master of psychology, master of gerontology, and two years experience. And then for the behavior specialist, uh, we added some additional specialties in there. Uh, th again, this is on the NHTD side. Uh, which gives you folks with a bachelor's degree in certification in dementia. Um, and then there's a uh, dementia, uh, a specialized care is dementia specialist uh, certification. Um, and then we also put in applied behavioral analysis because that is the current state of the art in the DD population. So we might have folks crossing over professions that way. I have a uh, quick question. Even though I don't receive PBIS, when um, the other, some of the other um, positions, it's been mentioned that uh, two years experience is needed. If someone's first starting out, where do they get that two year experience from? Well, that's a, that's a good point, Anne-Marie, which is why we want to go back and look at the internships and the student teaching experiences, and we would do that on this one too. Okay. You know, I say it, it, it also would not just be student, student teaching. I've had to turn down applications for a lot of social workers who work in Head Start programs. And in Head Start programs, they work with the families and the students. And my sense was we're very qualified because of that dynamic. Um, there's a pool out there from the Head Start programs that could assist us very well. So it's not just teaching. It yeah, the dilemma with that is, is that there are a lot of folks with teaching certificates that are working with adults. So this was originally designed, Jim, with the concept that we were, de we were developing a war an adult-oriented system. Mm -hmm. So that's the dilemma that you get into, you know. So I think probably that gets us back to the larger issue of saying family counseling. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a history of family count experience doing what we say is, is intensive behavioral plans, um, but probably looking also at the possibility of family counseling. Mm -hmm. You, did you consider or would you consider having, if someone's been a behavioral specialist for X amount of time, that at some point they don't, they've done it for 10 years, do they really have the same level of supervision and review of plans? Like at some point, don't they meet the standard without that level of supervision? I mean, there must be, it's like, you know, we have people who've been specialists forever who are the best people on the planet. They, they might be the really best. They, I think, I don't think the, the intent not necessarily actual supervision of the staff as much as a second set of eyes on the 
land itself. Sure. So from a, like from a protection of a human rights protection, it was really to put in place that there was going to be an extra set of eyes that was reviewing and approving the plan. And also looking at the data related to the targeted behaviors and the trends associated with the targeted behavior. So that's really why the supervision was put in place there. Jen was more along the lines of monitoring the progress of the plan and whether the plans needed modification, which if you're it's really just a second set of eyes rather than just the person writing the plan. Sure, but at some point they become certainly proficient. Like at to become level. a director? Yeah, to not have to review. I mean, that's okay. basically the difference between the director or not. Okay. And I say who's reviewing the directors. You know, I mean, at some point they've got to become. It makes sense. Yeah, all right. So this is a path with both of staff, too. Okay. What are the qualifications for a behavioral specialist? In, what, just, what just the, start kicking under the table. What are the qualifications for a behavioral specialist in a nursing home? Anybody? <laughs> Seriously, I'm just, you guys would be up in there. It's pretty much the same thing. It's You have to have at least some uh, history of working or being in the field of, you know, providing that hands-on care or redirection, dealing with behaviors. We have people from, you know, the Anderson House, who, which is right across the river from us, mm -hmm. which people would deal with people with autism that tend to have the similar behavior, mm -hmm. behaviors that we see. Right. But they're, and they're all ABA certified. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so I'm just trying to get a sense of comparable, yeah. and, and, and the behavioral specialist is always working under supervision, or there is... Yeah. A, yes. Just, just, just checking. Yeah. I mean, I know from my group home experience mm -hmm. that, you know, and in New Jersey, we had to have a PhD review. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. It really it does vary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So now we're moving on to one of our favorites, ILSP. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So now, I want to qualify this, okay, because... When we look at ILST, we are looking at a, a survey. We're not talking about skills training, okay? We are talking about a skills training plan, okay? And someone who trains the staff on how to implement that skills training plan, as well as doing the skills training. So it's a multifaceted individual, and it is not someone that's just going into the house and is going to work with that person on developing their independent living skills. So the thing that makes this service different from other waivers is the fact that it is supposed to be a professional staff at a higher level that's not, that's actually, whose role is to develop the training plan to train others in the actual implementation of the plan. So as a result, it's different than just going and doing ILST training for the individual as a direct service. That's really different from what my understanding. That's why I prefaced it, Anne Marie, because what it's a, this is another one of those services. Just like case managers get to do everything, they arrange transportation, and they, you know, the same thing tends to happen with the ILST. The ILST is, you know, ends up being the person that goes in and is doing all of these things with you, and not necessarily focusing on on much as like teaching your informal supports on how to help you do these things. Okay, so it's, it's, it's turned into much more of a direct service than what the initial program description and test was meant to be. But if it did change into that, I have a question that's necessary, right? Because if there are existing informal networks for people or there are resources for people, you know, Anne-Marie doesn't get HCSS, who's getting trained by the IRSC if she's doing mm -hmm. enough. Well, I don't have an I. I haven't had an ILST in, in over a year. Well, I understood that. I mean, uh, it also complements, in some ways, depending upon if there are APS involved, if there's family support, folks, scope of the service coordinator. I mean, there's a lot of complementary things happening to keep people in their home. So. Yeah, so I just give this as I don't a, want to go to the Jesse Road of is it worth talking about how to do different services yeah. provision, but I think it definitely is probably why it's a hot discussion is, mm -hmm. is because of all those factors. Yeah, but I, that's why I just want you to know that that's what the expectation is, is that it's a higher skilled, it's a higher trained individual than just someone that's going in and providing a direct care service. So, oh, oh, that's, uh, <laughs> so if they're supposed to be training, who's, who are the other 
other resources. Well, that gets to Jen's point, uh, uh, Anne-Marie, that in many cases it's working with the HCSS worker so that when the HCSS worker is in the house working with you on your ADL and IADL, they're just not doing personal care tasks with you. They're hopefully also training you on how to do those personal care tasks. So they would be working with the HCSS worker to develop, you know, to do some actual training tasks along with their other, their other responsibilities. So, for example, so your HCSS worker might be in the house and they're providing oversight and supervision. While they're there providing that oversight and supervision, they might be saying to you, come on, let's go, I'll show you, how, let's walk through how you go about doing your laundry so that the day will come that you're able to do it independently and then train you on how to do certain tasks that you currently aren't completely successful in. So is the ILST there with the AC? In some circumstances, yes. And also perhaps they are separately getting together when they're discussing my case, or is it all on site? It should all be on site. In fact, I believe the application in the uh, in the waiver language in the application specifically says that the waiver participant must be present. Well, you know, again, I'm not trying to come just come up with complaints and everything like that, but there's all kinds of gaps with this. Sure, okay. there is. And one thing that they should really look at is if the ILST is supposed to be there to help train HCS, okay. There's also this whole idea of duplication of services, that when they're paying for HCS, the ILST cannot, for the same hours, they can't put the ILST. Can't. You can build an overlap. You, can, into the you have to justify an overlap of yeah. services, and you have to clearly justify what the one service provider role is and what the other service provider role is going to do. Yeah, that, that could be easily. The point is, is that it's not a duplication of services. It's not the, necessarily the two people in the room at the same time. The RDS will not approve that if it's not. What about PBIS during the program? No. No, and that's 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 very clearly in the new waiver application. We have it very clear that it's not to be provided at the site of the day program. It's supposed to be provided in the home environment and with the individual. And what about PBIS at, with overlapping with HCSS? It may be it may be necessary because PBIS provides for training of the staff person on how to deal with certain behavioral techniques. However, again, that would be a, one of those things that would have to be very specifically justified in the service plan. Yeah. Yeah. PBIS isn't going to toilet the person either, so they, have yeah. need, they may need the staff there to help. I understand that, but these are to be honest, but these are things that I'm told one. We try to get PBIS. It can only be a certain time of the no, day. It can only and it can only be ten hours of training with. Provider. So if a PBIS goes in during HCSS hours, you have to justify the overlap, but then you're going to bail for only 10 hours of training. Okay, I, again, that's a personal thing. But there's another issue that ILST dealing with money, banking and money, but then the HCSS people aren't supposed to be dealing with money. I have a question. Um, so under this, this is proposed that you have the Master of Social Work or all psychology and geriatology, just coming from, you know, from our nursing home background, you're talking about somebody who has experience in doing functional based assessments for ADLs and IADLs. Mm -hmm. In our facility, that's an OT. That's not necessarily a social worker or a psych, you know, a psychologist. You know, I, in terms of finding availability for ILST, I think it dropping it down to someone who has an OT background. Registered OT is already in there. Yeah, so you would hear the, the existing OT. Okay. They can just have a bachelor's degree. She's just adding a few. So they would have to. Okay. So these are new ones. Okay. So add. I mean, you would say add adding add. the master's doesn't even matter if you really have a bachelor's degree. You're just mm -hmm. sort of reducing the years of experience. Exactly. Of yeah. Of course, we have to keep in mind what we're paying on Tuesday. Yeah. Codas are a good thing. You know, I mean, there's what lots of codas out there that yeah, do a, similar work. We do a lot of, we deal with a lot with the codas. Yeah. Right? They're just have to have five. You see, either one change the years of experience. Okay. What we're saying is maybe change the years of experience. And one of the things that the long history of the waiver is that HCSS used to have a path towards ILSC. It was one of the career opportunities for them. Obviously, it's restricted with an associate's degree, but if you go to the same thing on the experience being direct care experience necessarily as opposed to that functional assessment. And again, depending on what you're doing for training. Well, you got to remember, keep in mind that with the application, 
we changed a lot of the language associated with the functional assessment. It's not like somebody's going in and doing right. a separate functional assessment. Right. So that's wh that's why it changed that way. So I don't I don't know if that's going to work. I have uh, another term. Would you do me a favor, Jen, send me that in writing so I just have to look at it again? Okay, clarifying, because I'm trying my darndest to, to absorb this. Um, the fact that for over a year now, not having an ILST, and part, and part of that, and the fact that when I got my new service coordinator, she was desperately trying to find an ILST, and... Mm -hmm. And she was incredibly um, uh, proficient at digging around, and she was coming up empty. That either the agencies that she was looking at that they already had a full caseload, or it was becoming extinct, and that no one was. And part of that was because of the pay scale being abysmal. So I'm wondering, since you are um, introducing a new definition. To, to, to my awareness of what the ILST does with the HCSS, if the ILSTs are in extinct mode, who's th that? That means that are the a HCSSs are they dependent upon having the ILST as no. a? They're independent on their own. Yes. It's, it's just a, the a, HCSS worker in it has what is referred to as its own detailed plan. Anna. So, it, the, so what would happen is, is that detailed plan lays out very specifically what that HCSS worker is to do with you when they're in your home. So that is above and that's specific to that service. Now additionally, it could be that if an ILST is, is working with that same individual, that that ILST could say to that HCSS worker, let me give you some tips on how to work with Anne Marie when she's balancing her checkbook. And so then in that scenario, the ILST would work with the HCSS worker, but it's not mandatory. So how is, is there some kind of a uh, solution to uh, reinvigorating the pay scale for ILSTs for that particular uh, element of co there's always <laughs> There's always the effort to reinvigorate in this, in this unit. Amory, you know the request that. and comments around reimbursement do be noted. <laughs> well, to some degree, that might, I mean, not, not, this isn't directed at you personally. It's more <laughs> the, it's the, it's the, But I do feel like you would like a response. So I'm, I'm acknowledging the requests in the room around uh, and the thoughtfulness around the qualifications. Well, as because well it's as been a repeated question. I'm sorry. It's, it's been a repeated question. We, and we understand that. And we so, recognize that. And we, too, have to work within the confines of, of our limitations, too. So. You know, I, I think, though, that what she is raising the question of is what I would call the economics of the case. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's not just limited to ILST. Uh, any provider that needs to drive an hour to provide an hour of service to drive back to it and, it and get... And get paid for the one hour they actually saw the client, is looking at the eco economics of the case and saying, hey, this isn't working. Yeah, so. and that's, unfortunately, <laughs> that's the dilemma that Anne Marie has based on mm -hmm. where she resides. I mean, if sure. she was in downtown Manhattan, it might not be so bad. Sorry to throw that in there, but yeah. <laughs> I'm sure she's not going to make the change for that reason. You want to live in Manhattan? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm in the opposite direction. Okay, worth a try. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, it's, I was, I've been commenting to my team that it's been so, the length of time that I had my previous ILST, she was a rock star. I mean, she was a gem with me and her experience and her, how well she knew me. And so the idea of introducing a new one at this stage of the game, I'm fatigued just the thought of briefing this person on all the nuances that my previous one knew about me. And that's exhausting just to think about it. And so that's counter to what the awareness of, think, of understanding that the compensation, exactly what you, this gentleman just mentioned, I'm forgetting the name already. Jim. Jim. <laughs> Short-term memory on display. Um, so we will all agree, Emory, that rates are a concern. Okay? And as, as Lana said, we're very much aware of it. We consider it 
And we, we take that into consideration when we look at these qualifications, too. That's part of why we're having this, this discussion today. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You may consider, too, just to Jim's point, in the same way that like service formation is a monthly, that ILST might be one of those services that's better served depending upon the nature of it as opposed to episodic. Hmm. And if that changes the framework a little bit because it gives some yeah. flexibility. That's an interesting idea um, yeah. in terms of case law just to make it a little bit more. Say that again. To okay. change the reimbursement. Right now, ILST is payable on hourly increments. You have to do an hour. And what I'm saying is service creation is not like that. You do service creation on a monthly basis and you get paid for all the things you do. So an ILST is kind of similar to that. So if you change the payment, maybe it would make it more affordable on both sides for providers hmm. to provide it that way and for the waivers to afford having. Oh, that's okay. A, that's, that's a interesting consideration. I don't know what that's not. I mean, you have to look. But yeah. It does. Yeah, well, I have to, I, I'll be very honest with you. I haven't looked at the utilization, the ILST utilization in quite some time. Well, I just think of some of the logistics of ILST, too, yeah. banking being one of the biggest issues and making hours and how that's an impediment mm -hmm. on people who go to the program and yeah. the, the data work. Yeah. Yeah. Here will. But you guys should hear Jackson from like the that. consumers what the ILST really does. Okay. Because it's just like I said, I threw out banking, okay? Ends up ILST, ends up taking people to doctor appointments, haircuts, things like that. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, we See, and that, that's the dilemma that it creates for us. Because if you were to use that scenario, scenario, Jesse, some folks would say, well, then the ILST rate's too high because we're really paying them to do direct care level work. And if I go so, to the agencies, they say, because who else is going to do it? So, that's a problem. Yeah. I agree. I mean, the ILST should not be doing those those tasks, okay? But then HCSS doesn't doesn't do it either. Okay. All right. Good point. All right. So moving right along. <laughs> um, so structured day program director. I don't think we've had we've not had a lot of comments about this or or has the issue come up a lot, uh, but we went back and looked at it and for NHTD you're adding uh, the master of gerontology and one year of experience. And again, in this in this scenario, the one year experience is related to day program service. So moving on to TBI, basically for CIC we did the same thing that we did for NHD. Did you do anything different for anything on TBI? Uh, well, you'll see that we have some that are up for grabs. Could be a more flexibility. Well, no, we well when we looked at these, we sort of felt that they were okay the way they were but we wanted to leave them up for further discussion from you folks to see if, in fact, we, you know, we were considering things. I would just say keep them the same between TBI and HD because yeah. people don't do siloed things, and so one qualification under both, just so it's consistent, so you don't get in trouble, like, oh, I can do this under TBI, but not under okay. HD. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my opinion. Would sure. we say that's a general consensus? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And service formation is probably one of the you're going to get the training, but you know the NHD training and being dependent on the RDCs to do the service formation training, you can get someone on for TBI much easier. You're dependent on NHD training, <coughs> so like we've got to address the training yes. issue for that. Okay, please. All right. So we're, and same, honestly, on NHD for all of the services where the RDC is doing training, it's compelling providers to go through that training before they can you know, provide the service. You got to have some consistency because so you have an issue. All right, so we're in agreement that what we'll do is we'll make the quality consistent between the two programs. All right, so getting to the issue of, of the training, all right, um, obviously when, when these programs went into existence, it was certainly way before webinars and, and all sorts of other, you know, standardized types of training opportunities. We also know that the TBI program has a much more flexible training requirement than the NHTD. Uh, program. Well, so so the so what we are giving consideration to, and we're thinking we're looking to address this 
uh, in the upcoming program manual, and we've had some initial discussions with the RDCs, would be that we would treat NHTV the same as we do for TBI and have a certain curriculum that's required. The providers would be responsible to develop their own training curriculum and to implement the training and then we would be getting proof of those, those training opportunities. So what would happen is, is that the RBC would review your training curriculum, approve it. Um, once you're an approve, it's approved, you would be responsible for your own in-house training. And I think the only other requirement was is that the service coordinators would have to meet with the RBC. Um, what did I say, within the first 30 days of employment? I think we were talk, discussing within the first 30 days of employment for the RDC so that they could meet them um, and do whatever they felt on an individual basis uh, that particular staff person might need in terms of some additional discussion and direction from the RDC. So if that were to go forward, would we be getting some kind of certificate from the RDC or sign off saying we met with that person within the first yes. 30 days? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I have a concern about, I'm sorry to be making this, but we need to have the agencies do their own training program, okay? If the agencies themselves do not understand something correctly, it only gets passed on in training. Well, Jesse, I would say to you that each agency right now gets to be an approved PCA provider, and for your HCSS, they when we say that that person must be PCA level two trained, we have no involvement in that. That's a department curricula that each provider gets approved to provide, and each provider is provided. So every LICSA already is already doing their own staff training. Okay. I accept, I accept yeah. that for HCSS and things like that. So we're talking but about for, ILS, for ILST and service coordination. In okay. some cases, we're doing virtually no training right now for those. Right. Types. Okay. And that's when I can yes. see talking to people here that, you know, everybody doesn't understand the rules the same way. Mm -hmm. What does PCA stand for? Personal Care Assistant. Thank you. Um, so, a couple of my thoughts. Yeah. When you say RDC, there's TBI and HD. So mm -hmm. they're having to meet with two people to get signed off? No, it would be a joint. They do a joint. I'm just logistically speaking. Like, I'm going to have someone come and. No, you're going to go to them. No, I know. <laughs> I'm going to have someone to come to my agency, though, then to be, go through our training and then try to, I mean, could it be something where they attend the provider meet? I mean, is there some way to make it easier so that it's not so reliant on people's schedules? Because now I'm going to have to go to Adirondack, I'm going to have to go to Capital District, I'm going to have to go to, like, what, who's the RD, like, how many times does that service trainer get signed off if they're in different regions? So the service, co the service coordinator is going to go and meet with the RDC. The RDC is going to say that they felt that that person doesn't, you know, it meets, is doing well. They, they review some basic organizational structure. If it's somebody that says they've never written a service plan before in their life, they might review a service plan with them, talk about training of a service plan. They're, it's, we're just basically saying you're trying to get a basic skills assessment of that individual. I mean, for me, it seems like a lot of hoops to run through when it's really on the agency to make sure that the person is qualified and the RDC will start Right, so you can't, which do you want? Right now, you want us to take back and say we're going to continue to train all the service coordinators and oh. run into that delay? Oh. Or you want to send them to the RDC for one no, day and meet with the RDC? <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to do neither of those. Um, well, the RDCs won't agree to that, all right? And I'm going to tell you right now is, is because they're very concerned about the quality of some of the service coordinators and that they're concerned about some of their product. In some cases, what I'm trying to avoid is this issue of service plans being sent back and forth two and three times because they don't know how to write a service plan, right? And their feeling is, is that not all of the providers are meeting their end of the deal in terms of sufficiently training their staff once they're in-house. So we sort of came to an agreement. You eyeball the person, you identify that they present to you, that they have certain skills and expertise, and then based on that assessment, you're going to let they move forward back to the to the provider, but there's got they want to know who that person is because they're reviewing their plans and they want to know that when they get on the phone and talk to that person about the quality of their service plans that they want to know who's on the other end of the phone. Yeah, but that I mean, so what if they say no? 
I've now hired someone other than No, they're not going to say no. They're going to say they're going to get on the phone to you and say that they've already indicated that this person's going to need some additional support and training on, on person-centered planning or on how to complete their service plan or that they need to know more about available community resources. And they're going to suggest to the provider that these are things that you're going to want to follow up with that person. In some cases, it may be nothing more than an introduction for that person to say, okay, so, you know, you're going to be working with what, what participants, what area are you covering, so that they, they can attach a face to the plan that they're reviewing. I don't think that's an unrealistic request. I mean, I think it is not well defined. In terms well, it of might the, be. It might get further defined in the weeks ahead. This is this is a concept that we presented in an attempt to reduce the complaints that we're getting from providers saying that we're delaying the process. They're having to send people all over the place to get the training. So we're trying to accommodate you by allowing you to do some of the training and be independent. But on the other hand, there has to be sufficient oversight of the actual most important person in our waiver participants' lives. And then as far as compensation, so we hire someone, right, and we're doing training, we're getting them ready, and now we're having them go to meet with the, I mean, we're taking that on as the agency, right, the, the burden of... You'd rather go the first 30 days without them not being able to provide services because they haven't been able to get trained? Oh, yeah, for right now. Under any so you want to pay them for 30 days? No, 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 what I'm saying, I am now. Right yeah. Now, sort of so within that first 30 days, you're going and you're meeting with the RDC. You're paying them already anyway. Mm -hmm. I just, to me, it's the logistics more than the, the... So let's just think about that a little more. I mean, I think you both have compelling... I mean, I understand what you're saying in terms of the dynamic. I'm just wondering logistically, you know, we've had them review resumes or have phone calls or have something as opposed to sort of a... I don't know. But you're suggesting you're not sending them to the RDC for training now. We are, but what I'm okay. saying is that I can, under TBI, have someone come on board, get our training, and start doing service coordination without having any interaction with the RDC. And HGD, I cannot. I have to have them go get trained before they can provide, which, quite honestly, in our region, can be months and months and months. So people end up sort of having more TBI cases than an HGD. And, and what we're talking about doing is moving to the TBI model, which and within great. that first 30 days, they go and meet with someone in the RDC. Uh, great, except I'm just worried logistically about the practice of a service partner being able to do that based on our EC schedule and making sure that you know both the NHG and the TDI person is there and so it they very well could be that then we have the RDC set up one day a month that's going to be their sure. training day. and then still I would ask for each you're region. in multiple regions yeah. so I have okay. to go to every region and get signed off by all no. regions no. Well, so it would be by case load of the service coordinator. So no, like we'll it's by, in the first 30 days they have to go show up at the RDC say hi I'm one the one service RDC. coordinator yeah. And and the and the RDC confirms with the with the provider that they they met with the person and welcome aboard. No, I understand that, but there's some people who are dual approved for two different regions. So if service coordinator, no, we're saying one we're saying one region. One one, one region's whatever, approval one, would cover all the regions. One region is going to sign off that they met with that person. They will talk to what other regions that person is working. Does that work? I mean, it seems like that could work. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of where the practicality of the person is. Well, like, I get the concept of it, and I, and I appreciate so, that part so of it. But I would just say to you, like, even let's just say right now, like, getting a certificate to demonstrate that someone has this, and if we put it in and nobody comes in and says, demonstrate to us that you had this, I would just make sure that sort of... Let me tell you right now, OMIG doesn't cite you unless they call us and check with us first. So if we say that that certificate is there and that that is sufficient, they're gonna they're, they will sure, accept it. We go over all well, these protocols with them before they even come to you. Right now, to get an NHGE service creation certificate from the RDC well, has taken forever. So I literally have months. Well, and months I need of to know that so we can fix that. You, right. You've addressed my issue. You know, in this conversation, I hear what's best for the consumer. Okay, and certainly having training. Okay. It's best for the consumer, but it goes further, okay? But I think she's not arguing the training. She's arguing the logistics and yeah. how getting that is operationalized. No, so I, I think... I, 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 yeah, but I'm, I a think I'm a consumer, okay? And I somehow become... I try to get out to the waiver. Okay? I finally find a service coordinator. This service coordinator becomes God now, okay? That's my... I don't talk to the RRDC, okay? Whatever the service coordinator says, I'm entitled to... I gotta believe. 
Okay? If I say I want this or that, okay, I can't go against the service coordinator. I have to... Which is why we got the conflict of interest. <laughs> nobody knows that, though. But nobody knows that. But, you know, the, pro the problem that exists yeah. right now, if, if I hire a service coordinator tomorrow down in Putnam County, and the next service coordination training is in Capital Region or in the Adirondack Region, that's a real problem. That's a logistical yeah. issue. No. Yeah, yeah you're right about that. that. Yeah, I, I, I let, let's, let's, issue, right? let's yeah. I'm, which is I what we're moving we away from. Right, we're moving away which from it. Great. Right, and I think we can agree to monitor these operational issues and try to address them in a way. And if there's others, right, so I'm hearing timing. It shouldn't take so long, right, to access training, right? We want to make sure there's a flow of folks. So we'll, we'll You know, you we'll have to look at it from that. the RDC side, too. They're not going to run a three or five day training if there's one person sitting in the room. Oh, really? So that's been the other dilemma. They have a time and resource issue just as you have a time and resource right. issue. But you know, on a, on a positive note, three weeks ago I had the, uh, the uh, trainers, the, the service group, RDS has come out from the providers and, and do a, a training for us. Um, it, I, th I think that if we could get that kind of request, let's say I've got five service coordinators who I really want to bring up to speed. Our, our agencies have come out mm -hmm. to our agency and done a training, and right. that, that's, that has that's helped a lot. That's what's supposed to happen. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, you know, keep us, you know, if you're having issues, keep mm -hmm. us apprised. Yeah. I think the biggest thing, though, just to keep in mind is I just don't want to create the dynamic where they have the ability to say no to an employee. No, they're not going to do that. They're yeah. just, they're trying to get an idea of what that person's strengths and weaknesses are. That's all. Okay. So, um, are there folks on the phone with questions that we should go to? Are there questions there that we need to hit? No, I think we addressed them all. We're going to go back to Randy. What was Randy? I think it's not what it's for Randy. It's a qualification issue. It, I think his question was if, so, um, some of the um, participants that have maybe run through providers or difficult participants, what happens when there isn't at least one willing and able provider to take that person? We actually need two willing providers because there'd have to be a service coordination provider and another provider right. of the other service. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the questions. Mm -hmm. So that could, uh, so that's, a, that's an issue. Yep. Mm -hmm. Those will be okay. issues we will definitely have to sort through. I do not have a magic bullet answer for that question. Um, so, 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 Randy, we're going to put that in a category of difficult to serve participants, which are going to have other issues associated besides just that one. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd be happy to speak to you about those difficult to yes. serve participants. <laughs> yeah, quite there. a few. Well, and You've got a lot of experience with that. That's a very yes. valid point because what tends to happen when we have these conversations is we forget about the, the uh, traffic jam that occurs from the nursing homes to the community <laughs> because of the need to find service coordination agencies and people willing to serve those those hard to serve individuals. Correct. So that's a that's a very important point that we yeah. shouldn't lose sight of either. Yeah. Because we get a lot of issues that agencies don't want to pick them up because they're they have behavior as well as their TBI or need for housing. Yeah. Yes. Or in fact problem. I had this discussion yesterday when I was down in New York City that there are clearly some providers who will not take on any nursing home case if they feel that the need is housing because they don't want to dedicate the resources to help that individual find out. I can second that. That's, that's a systems right issue that at some point in time we are going to have to address. Yeah, it's a big issue. So on the payment side, um, <laughs> well, it's really, I think the incentive on the ISP is only upon admission. And so you mm -hmm. run into the problem of people who do a lot of work and for whatever reason, so I don't, again, I don't know how much flexibility, but I think it would create a better dynamic for people to be encouraged to try and get people into labor. Like if, some, if you bring someone out and they buy, mm -hmm. you don't get paid, or if you are unable to successfully find housing for whatever multitude of reasons, and then there's a lot of, a lot of Yeah, the problem with it is, is we can't reimburse for a waiver service for someone that never gets on the waiver. Um, yeah. 
So are we are we looking for more questions or we I think we're done. So I really want to thank everyone um, for two hours on a Friday in August for coming together. Um, it appreciate uh, the discussion today and the qualifications. If there's any comments you want to send to us in writing, that team can take them. Um, I think because there is a process here of actually, uh, you know, engaging CMS and doing an actual amendment, um, you know, I think I would ask that if you have uh, any comments on what we presented to get them to us in the next week or so. Um, and if you have any, you know, lots of good discussion here today, but if you have other, you know, major issues, I think what I'd like to do is um, take your comments into consideration and then turn it back around for folks. <laughs> Um, with the, you know, I think this is where we're going, and maybe a, a quick last shot at anything that you you don't see in the turnaround, um, and then begin to have discussions with CMS. I think we've given them a heads up. We're thinking in this direction um, to help with our transition issues. So um, I'll ask for that to do from you all, and then uh, if you can get that back to us. And in the meantime, uh, in return, we will provide to you the data that we talked about earlier today, and then I think our next step would be um, look for a, a scheduled uh, webinar around data and following up here um, on the qualifications in early September. Does that, I hope that works for folks on the phone mm -hmm. as well. Sure. The NHB amendment got submitted, right? Mm -hmm. And so whatever the clock is on that, that'll be part of the next So there's the technical process of submission, but that doesn't prevent us from engaging CMS in discussion. And so as soon as we wrap it up here, we will. But we don't, we can't typically, um, they're, sequ they're sequential. So to your point, we have to wrap up one and then follow with the other. But we always, you know, work in ahead of time and share drafts and have discussions. And so, um, but I would like to be in a position to certainly let CMS know that as we, 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 this is a collective, collaborative, you know, uh, proposal to them around qualifications, um, and I think it's important they understand that it's coming from the folks who are challenged with finding the right people, right, to to, to provide the services, and that it comes from the right place of, you know, also being mindful of quality. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that. But I think uh, and for one other thing, absolutely. And I don't know if you're gonna kill me, um, <laughs> but uh, we've been tabling it just because we. Suggest that that's going to be a new, Later. basically a yeah. new service, so that we oh, would, maybe. yeah. <laughs> so we would have to deal with that as a separate. I would want to deal with it. What I, what you don't want to do is have an entire amendment hold because right. one issue hold up everything else. So we're, we're probably better off there, dealing so. with. So, so, so consider it out there. I yeah, mean, I think it's something. No, it's a good point. We can we can talk about. Um, I think I'd also like to. It's at some point in all of this. There's uh, electronic visit verification is also going on, um, and. We should talk a little bit about that too. Um, there, there's no alarming issues. I think folks know we've been doing stakeholder engagements uh, across the state. We've concluded those, but it, you know, in particular, if this group has questions, you know, we'd be happy to, to talk to EDB. I guess well. the only clarifying thing that you've never said, but I just thought it to you is it only applies to HSS, correct? You're not thinking about that's the way we're dealing with it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Because that would be. So um, I think that brings us to a close. I really want to thank everyone on the phone for uh, joining today as well, and those of you who uh, made the trip on a nice sunny day. Enjoy your travel festival.